the official Zoomcast of Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. He's an American guitar legend and musical director for The Conan O'Brien Show. Hear untold stories from Jimmy and his musical guests. They will talk music, its influence, culture, and future on The Green Room with Jimmy Vivino with special guest Keone Keller. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Oh, there ain't no crowd. There ain't no ball game. We're in negotiations. But there is a green room, and here we are with my guest, Keone Keller, relief pitcher for the San Diego Padres. This was recorded a while back during the COVID. Uh, remember those days? During the COVID strike. <laughs> we were all on strike. And uh, and I it, love baseball. I love music. I love them both. I love talking to Keone about baseball. And uh, I hope you dig it. Hello, Keone. Uh, can I say Key? Yeah, you call me Key. All good. Because, you know, I'm from the Italian neighborhood where everyone has a nickname. We don't uh -huh. use anybody's whole name. Uh, Keone Kela, correct? Is that, is that uh, the correct Kella. pronunciation? Kela. Yeah, Keone Kela. Mm -hmm. uh, of uh, Hawaiian her uh, heritage. Uh, uh, and I'm not sure what else. Maybe Hispanic or African American. Uh, yeah, uh, black and Hawaiian. A little bit of white. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, you, it's like The Rock, you know? <laughs> it's a new world, man. <laughs> yeah, it's like exactly. it's like a new it, it's a it's a new world and it's it's a better world. I I, I know that I, I'm wearing my San Diego hat, you see, mm -hmm. and uh, and and I'm uh, really a Yankee fan. That because I live in L.A., uh, you know, I'm kind of a uh, watch the Dodgers because I can see them every day. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, uh, we are. This, we we can all get together, obviously, <laughs> yes. even over a game. There is nothing as fickle as sports fans, as you know, that they mm -hmm. love you one day, the next day you come in, and you're not doing what they think you should do. I mean, how how does that affect a pitcher when you were closing, especially? I think uh, you know you're coming in in the hottest spot in the game, and it's really all on you. I mean, that is the biggest moment, right? Yeah. Um... You know, there's a lot of emotions that, that go on um, in preparation to uh, to go out and close out the game in the ninth inning. But that's also the reason why we do it um, is just that excitement, the electricity, being able to feel, you know, feel the fans, the fans' energy, um, and really just to be able to shut that door, you know, on a game is probably, to me, one of the greatest feelings I've, I've ever been able to experience in my life. And you know, I thrive off the adrenaline of being in those um, high leverage situations and going to close the door and just to chime in on what you're talking about, you know, fans wavering here, here, or there. It's, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it, it's kind of it's the nature of the beast. You know, it's what you signed up for. And it, it comes with the territory. So the only thing I can, you know, tell anybody that ever comes into that situation is just prepare yourself to the best of your ability, go out there with confidence, be convicted, have intention with what you're doing. And, you know, our main job and one of the things that I've learned in this game is the most, my one job is to execute my pitch and everything else after that doesn't matter. You know what I mean? I have, I have eight guys on the field that are there to do their, to do their best and to utilize their ability to help the team as best as they can. And all I can focus on is, is, is making my best pitch. Um, and that's that's and that's it and, and that's from pitch to pitch you know absolutely that's a mm -hmm. that's a that's a change of head for each pitch you know and yes. so how how important is it for a layman like me when i when i ask who's catching you because some guys will say i gotta have this catcher you know mm -hmm. i mean how is that a fact for you or in general yeah to a degree to a degree it is um but I have to, to me, I, my belief is that I have to be prepared for anybody that wants to step into that box. You know what I mean? And yeah. the catcher, you, you're supposed to do, you're supposed to do as much pregame as you can, as much pregame video, um, scattering reports as you can um, against the opposition. And I mean, I've I've felt that before, but I think that's kind of an immature way to look at it. Things, you know what I mean? Because I just feel like it places. Yeah, yeah doubt or defeat in your mind. And I mean, 
this you, you can't. It's an excuse. Yeah, right? it's an excuse. Exactly. I mean, at the end of the day, this 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 game is going to go on the back of your bubblegum card. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> well, you, gotta, you know, you gotta, when we used to gotta, buy bubblegum cards, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, and I mean, it's so man, this is so great to talk to you because. I, I, you know, I, I did a, a big show at the Beacon Theater last week for God's Love We Deliver, mm-hmm. who, who get food to disabled people, you know, year yeah. round. You know, millions are raised. And my dressing room uh, mate was Bernie Williams, who was, mm-hmm. you know, an old, who, who was like one of my heroes. And he became a great guitar player after he retired. I mean, he is mm-hmm. really as good as they get. And I said, hey, look, I'm going to retire. You think I should take up baseball? Because, you know, <laughs> I said, a little late, son, but the Yankees could use, he still, his head is still in the game. I guess your mm-hmm. head will always, right now, you are on, uh, had, had TJ surgery, uh, Tommy John, mm-hmm. for those who don't know. There's, how do you feel about kids getting it preemptively, which I've read about in um, high school? I mean, it happened, you know, I'm actually um, rehabbing over at uh, TMI, which is uh, Keith Meister's facility in Arlington, Texas, with um, an all-star and Kirby Yates, who's also from Hawaii. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, he actually got TJ prior to, I want to say he got it in high school, about 15, 16 years old. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he was able to come back and, and, have a resurgence of the game, become a, a all star, and and do some good things in this game. Um, but in regards to like now with these kids, I think there's just a lot of a lot of stress that's being put on these kids. I think there's a lot that's being asked of these kids so young, um, yeah. compared to when I was in the game growing up. I mean, I played select ball. I played, you know, I did the travel thing. But let's just, back up a little bit and talk about talk about your as a kid. All right, where mm-hmm. is it? Where is it? You know, I knew at nine years old, music was for me. When, when was it? What was the spark? Um, I mean, it was the first sport that I fell in love with, for one. You know, um, my dad and my mom, they both played the game. My mom softball. My father played baseball. And that's where they met was on the baseball field. So, you know, yeah. uh, it was, I think the torch was kind of passed in that sense um, because their dreams weren't necessarily realized because they had kid a, a child so young. Um, yeah. So I, I started playing the game when I was about three, three, three or four years old, and I started at Dolphin Park in Carson, California. And yeah, you know, I but I, I knew that I really wanted to take this somewhere when I got to about 11, 12 years old. You know, because yeah. I, then I was able to really kind of. Uh, my talent was able to speak speak volumes for itself in, in regards to how, how I could play within the demographic of kids around me. And once I saw that I had like a real natural talent for it, I just dove all in, you know what I mean? And, and gave my, well, gave I mean, my could entire... you play as a kid? Could you play anywhere? Cause most kids don't know yeah, like, they're going to be a pitcher, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I played outfield shortstop catcher third, um, never really played first, played all the out, every single outfield position, all infill positions besides first. How'd you hit? I hit pretty well. I hit I hit I hit pretty good in high all the way until high school, man. Hit 525 in high school, but you know, <laughs> yeah. when you're when you're 18, 17, 18 years old and you're throwing 90, 93, 94, 95 miles an hour, you know, um I think that's what the scouts were really really high on and um you know, they they knew that I had a mentality to that can shut down innings and I could I knew how to manage myself from a very early age uh in in high intensity um, situations, you know, and so and they were scouting just, you by the time you were a senior or before that. Um, a little bit prior to that, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. We would have scouts that would yeah. come out to showcases and stuff like that. Yeah, and 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 um, it wasn't that long. If I, I'm looking, thinking of the timeline, it wasn't that long. But maybe you went went to to college for a year before you went into the bit into uh, into AAA yeah. or. Yeah, so I got drafted in 2011 out of high school by the Seattle Mariners um, in the 29th round, didn't sign, um, felt like I wanted to have the college experience, if you will. You know, I, I thought that yeah. there was something to be experienced in college, but little little be known, I, I didn't know. I went to a JUCO that wasn't really that – it wasn't really that popping or anything. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I went to yeah, that well. like got the – the college experience, but I just wanted to see what that was about. And then the next following year, got drafted in the 12th round by the Rangers. Played um, two years of minor league ball. Um, and then ha- had opportunity to be a non-roster invite 2015. 
Um, as you know, timing is everything in the game. This was uh, the yeah. time where Ron Washington had departed. Um, we had just got a new manager in Jeff Bannister. And things just fell in alignment where um, I was pitching well through spring. There was some open slots in the bullpen. You became and, a closer, right, for the Rangers? Uh, I became a, a high high inning guy, seventh, eighth inning guy. I became okay, pretty much a setup inning, guy at yeah. that time. That, 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 that Yeah, at that moment, we, had, we still had Neftali Feliz uh, in the back end. Um, we had uh, Sean Tolleson, who then closed. And I want to say he had yeah. about a 37, 37 save year. He did really well. Um, and then in 2000, I got – You had a 2.39 ERA with the Rangers, I believe, according yeah, to the stats that I read. Yeah, that was that's that's that was pretty one, damn good. <laughs> that's one of my best campaign years. Yeah, absolutely. One of my best years in my in my career. And, but then um, the elbow surgery came first, right? Then then after I that – that... This is actually the first surg- major surgery that I've had in pro baseball. So I've been very fortunate, you know, I – I had some setbacks where I would get shoulder inflammation. I had bone chips at one point where there were some yeah. loose bodies in my elbow. They had to scrape out, but that's nothing too, yeah. too serious. So um, I've been fortunate enough to, you know, play parts of um, six years. And this is my seventh year. Played the first month, but um, just couldn't keep You've up. You've been playing man. since you're 21. They brought yeah. you up. Now, now, here's a question about that, okay? I know a lot of teams, especially my Yankees, they keep a guy down because yeah. they don't want to get him up too young and lose him too early. But yeah. they're wasting people. They're wasting people down there. You probably know people that have been down there too long that should be playing in the game. Uh, there, well, yeah. and, and I think that there's yeah. over signing older players, you know, for too many years. Uh, and then um, the, the diminishing yeah. returns thing. We've seen it happen. I'm not going to mention names about that. But yeah. uh, I think it's a young man's game. I do. It is. You know? I mean, it's a young man's game, and it also serves an economical purpose, too, for the ownership groups to keep it a young man's game with the contracts that are uh, in, that are set in stone right now. You know what I mean? Because yeah. you sign when you sign your first initial contract, it's a six-year contract with the club that you're with. So yeah. before you can even get to arbitration, you're making league minimum for your first three years. And then you can get yeah. to arbitration in year four, arbitration two in year uh, yeah. five, and then your last year arbitration prior to free agency uh, in year three. So, or sorry, in your sixth year on the show. So, I mean, uh, if we're talking being advantageous for, for a corporate structure, you know, I yeah. mean, yeah. instead of paying a guy who's 31, 32, yeah, business. If you're instead of paying a guy 31, 32 who has, this experience or talent. Well, we got this kid who's 18, 19 years old from Curacao or Venezuela who can potentially put the same output, a little bit more exciting ball player, you know, and he's going to, and they're wondering can... why the game isn't exciting. You know what I mean? This is a com. we're making common sense. Now, the more kids and young people you get into that game, that's why college mm-hmm. basketball is so great. You know, Absolutely. it's like the hungry are out there on the field, you know, yeah. the overfed, aren't going to play the same way. I don't care what you say when you pay, when you're paying $300 million out there, what coach are you going to listen to? (laughs) You know, (laughs) and, and uh, there's, it's so much, uh, would you explain the rule five thing to me? Um, I know like the rule five uh, for like the minor leagues is pretty much on your fifth year. Um, the team has to make a decision as to whether or not they want to put you on the 40 man roster or you become a free agent to yes. where, to where any other team can then uh, pick you up. But then they have to, I want to say they have to put you into the level above. Yeah. I, I don't know the specifics, so I honestly can't tell, really tell you um, about it. I mean, I mean, I, I ain't alive and fortunate to never have to face that. Right. No, uh, you got out in two years. But uh, to, to, the, to all of my music friends listening, this is like what we used to call the Chitlin circuit, right? Mm-hmm. Minor yeah. league. It's like paying your dues, you know, oh, man, and you're yeah. doing you're paying it. your dues, man. It's... You're paying dues and they're not paying you. You're paying no, dues, no. you know, and there's some cats get married and have families and it gets to be stress and pressure and and also you know as in as with anything with young people when we're hanging you know we could be misbehaving sometimes too you know we're just kids 
you know? Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. uh, I, can, I can tell you some funny stories, man. I mean, I just remember we used to be on, uh, you know, those coach, those stagecoach buses and, you know, uh, we used to sleep on like, we'd put like a crate, the foam a crate uh, on the bottom under the seats because we'd have a kid sleeping on the two seats above and then somebody would be laying under and sometimes you didn't need uh-huh. a blanket because your body would get warm from the engine of the, of the of right the right and, or that engine could hum you to sleep man yeah or man i mean we've stopped night. at every i feel like i've i've seen it's been such a beautiful experience though you know because i got to see the countryside of america i got to see the roots of america um yeah. you know been to to some pretty cool places some places that i probably would have never even thought I would ever yeah. w- went to or experienced if I hadn't been, hadn't played minor league baseball. And then on top of that, you know, your salary, a uh, low a double a, I mean, you're making four or five, six hundred dollars every two weeks. And then you still have yeah. your, your expenses, you know, in double a, I was still sharing a one bedroom spot with two of my teammates, you know, one's yeah. actually is a pitcher for the Colorado uh, Rockies. His name's uh, Alex Chichi Gonzalez, he played yep. at Oral Roberts, went to the Texas Rangers um, organization, but he's with them now. And then another guy named Chris Grayson, who's from uh, Louisiana. And I mean, we had we were sleeping on air mattresses, man. We were we were working with Walmart's rollback policy, man. We were buying, we were getting our stuff and taking and it back. Totally, in totally, <laughs> totally a multi culty situation too. Oh, I think yeah, there's man. more togetherness, you know, in in music and and sports uh, on the inside, you know. Yeah. People, people need to make statements now on the outside, you know, about mm-hmm. about injustices and things that needs this the time we live in. I'm an old fan. I don't want to be an old thinker, you know. Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, well, and, baseball, and I know baseball the game. sports, sports and music shatter a lot of those things that you and I see um, in the media for the most part yeah. every day. Because, I mean, I, you and I, I'm sure we sat at the round table with everybody from every creed, color, oh, yeah. religion sexual yeah. it doesn't i'm cool man it's love with me you know straight and up. we are all the same if we exactly. if we're especially when we're like-minded about a certain thing and then mm-hmm. we find out that oh you know your your family situation was the same as mine or you know mm-hmm. uh you know and, we're, and and it's just uh i've always said to people too you're all dividing yourselves more than we ever were you know by putting yeah. put, putting us all in boxes but Let's talk about kids now, because uh, the truth is baseball. And, you know, I grew up in luckily, uh, unfortunately, uh, in a town that had three baseball fields in it, you know, in the mm-hmm. little league system. But it was not, you know, you, you, you had to buy a mitt, uh, you know, a Rawlings glove at that time. It, it cost about fifteen dollars. It's probably one hundred and fifty dollars now to get well, a real not good more glove. now, brother, if not more, depending on what kind of your model and. You know, yeah, it's it's crazy, yeah. and crazy a bat, stuff you know. Yeah. We had community bats, you know that everyone shared the bat. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and pick it up, right? Well, you know, so did baseball in the beginning. They used to just yeah. drop the bat at the plate, and the next guy would come up and use the bat. But you yeah. know, the, the maintenance of the fields, you know, to get also to try to get. We used to play with like twelve guys sometimes, you know, not you know two outfielders or whatever, but to get eighteen kids together too. Right. Uh, it, it, it has to be organized by and it yeah. has to be funded to get a basketball and get get uh, two or three kids to 10 kids together is easy, you know, mm-hmm. and 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 I know we're trying with baseball, but uh, my friend Donald Fagan wrote a song called Glamour Profession about basketball. Mm-hmm. It was glamorous to kids, uh, very gangster, you know. Uh, even going back to Walt Fraser back when I was watching, he was a yeah. Mac daddy, you know, and uh, and baseball has always been a very structured sort of uh, it's a slower game. It takes more patience to watch. I think baseball is a gangster sport, a gangster ass sport, too. I just don't I just don't think people are willing to pay attention to the depth of the strategy behind the game and, and the intellect yeah. that has to go into the game. I mean, it is a game of chess, not checkers. And yes. there's so many different facets of the game that have to be explored and conquered and mastered in order to to really bring to bring a win a win. I mean, there's so many different sequences. I'm sure you, you, you've seen, man. I mean, baseball is a wild game. Anything can happen at any moment. Well, I mean, you know, I agree with you that analytics has helped, I think, 
uh, with with the audience. Yes and and yes fans. and no. Yes and no because not on the field so much. <laughs> yeah, but, no, no, because the thing is, is it's for instance for you when you were out and with with your buddies and you guys were um, scouting talent or seeing seeing other guys with talent. I mean, you could hear guys with two of this. They can they can strum the guitar the same way, sing at the same level, but you knew who, who's ready to drop their nuts. You can tell who's got it, who you're wired with it. You know what I, I mean? Call that it, I call it heart, heart to hand. Heart, yeah, man. And, 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 heart you, to can't hand. Measure, and you, you can't measure you gotta that. You got to leave the head out, right? You got to leave yes. the head. You can't and, get inside your head. Yeah. But that's the one thing in the game is analytics has, has made a strong push in the game and it's helped our game. But it's also it takes the heart out of the game and it makes it very robotic. Well, where, I think we're in balance. It's new still, so yeah. the balance hasn't come back between, you know, the manager I mean, with think, a cut. Let's think about the moment when you watch – let's talk about Billy Buckner, you know, when he had that ball yeah. that went under his legs. I mean, that guy's a freak. People people shunned him and shamed him for a, a long time <laughs> for that, but people don't – he's a tremendous baseball player. He had a tremendous oh, yeah. career, you know, yeah. and, and I say that to say that – well, like Tommy Pham had the same It's the human thing. error. It's the human error that makes our game great to me. Tommy Pham, right? Didn't Tommy Pham have the same thing happen? Where when? He, uh, I, I believe a ball went through his legs or something and, you know, in a playoff game. And uh, I, I think it was Tommy. I, if I'm mistaken, though, I, I, might be, I might be mistaken. But it's happened. Re- it happens all the time, you know. Mm-hmm. How do you get out of some – you know, it, it's a game of percentages. It's the only game – or the only thing in life where a hitter, you, if you're if you're doing the job at one third, okay, you're a genius. If you're hitting three hundred, yeah. you know, it's hard yeah. to hit that ball, man. It's hard yeah, to. That, that's why it's such a strikes. special game, Jimmy. Yeah. You know, it's because it's the closest. I think baseball is one of the games that teaches you most about life. Yeah, you know what I mean. I mean, just the 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 struggle. I mean, let's not forget this is a blue collar game. Guys were just up until the seventies, eighties. I mean, I'm sure even early nineties, guys were working jobs in their off seasons to pay to oh, take yeah. care of bills. You know, and so um, I just think that uh, I think that this game right here, man, is it it it's a testament of what can be done in life. You know what I mean? How, and it teaches, there's so many values. I would say it's been one of the greatest teachers. It's my sensei yeah. in a sense, you know well, what I'm saying? And it's, and it's also your college. You said you went to, you checked out college, but you knew like I did that the life experience, cause you knew what you wanted to do was yeah. going to way outweigh another four years of English classes and history classes. And, you know, because we want to know about the baseball language <laughs> the baseball history, everything related to college to get people ready applies to baseball. Like you said, mm-hmm. you know, knowing the history is important. I, I, I got to say, my man, my man, <laughs> I, I have to mention it because it blows my mind. But Clint Fraser, one of the young Yankees, was wearing a shirt, a Mickey Mantle shirt. And it said, Mickey Mantle, switch hitter. And the interviewer said, oh, you got the Mickey Mantle switch hitter. And Clint <laughs> says, switch hitter? I didn't know Mickey Mantle was a switch hit, switch hitter, and that blew my mind. I said, "Come on, yeah. kids, get some hit." You probably have more history from your family being involved in the game, you know, and interested in the game. Um, yeah, I mean, I just grew up, um, you know, an avid fan of the game. From I think my era, you know, being an early '90s baby, I I kind of am part of the last Mohicans that got the the runoff from you guys of like, yeah. you know, just collect the true you know collecting cards and things were just different you know what i'm saying so i used to really collect cards i used to watch espn classics and you know in black and white and all that stuff because i wanted to be like the big leaguers i wanted to have a big old golf ball in my mouth you know of chalk oh yeah Yeah, that's right (laughs) it just it there's just something we used to make believe i don't know if you ever copied people's wind-ups or deliveries but we used to copy the batting stance of a cat yeah that was the thing you copy batting stance you try to call them out yeah you know what i mean or try to do people's uh go through someone's mechanics and try to call out who that pitcher was i mean well, right, that's right. It was a game. Playing pepper. Yeah, playing pepper. Or I remember just I just remember when kids, or at least when I was a kid, I mean, if I was with Billy, James, and Nick, Billy's hat was freaking first base. 
uh, yeah. you know, your buddy, my, my sweater was second, the red car was third and we made a makeshift home with a pack of yeah. gum or whatever. Like, yeah. Or, or, or if the cat's wearing his hat like this, you know, you did that. Yeah. Remember Don I, Trump I Willis. Say, yeah. The D train. I mean, the D train. <laughs> and I love the excitement that's being brought into the game. You know, uh, I think that that the game needs it in order to to get more eyes on on how special the game of baseball it is uh, baseball it is, and um, you know because I think it like it's always been America's pastime. I mean it's it's a foundation of uh, of American sports, and I think that um, more people should take a take an interest and in at least just trying to t- trying to identify why the game is so special and see all the great things that we do for you know, for communities, for charitable uh, acts, for the military. I mean, there's just yeah. so many great things that we do in baseball to try to connect uh, the community around us and the world as well. Yeah, there's a lot of Sandlot, you know, sort of found, uh, foundations trying mm-hmm. to get this back into the hands of kids. Uh, but you know what? More than any other sport, it is, it is people say, oh, it's not the World Series. Yes, it is. We have people from all over the world playing mm-hmm. this sport you know it doesn't mean that your your con- your whole team from your country has to be in the game you know in yeah. an olympic sense but mm-hmm. you know we there's more asians now there's and we're starting to we're starting to you're going to start to see anyway more europeans coming over the game is going you know hawaiians i was Absolutely. surprised when i looked up because i said what a perfect place to play baseball you know i yeah. think you know um yeah, man. And and uh, okay, let's let's get to something here. You were involved because I know you're old school because you got up off the bench in a couple brawls, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's the passion that I love to see. You know, when it gets yeah. down to that, it's you know usually the ma- usually the manager got thrown out first for protecting his team. You know, yeah. uh, 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 you know. I mean, that's a heat of p- passion moment when all of you guys get up you know, and just stand up for each other. And I think it yeah. brings the team together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. I mean, I think that those moments, um, I think that those moments in the game are, are very special because um, not necessarily for the, for the, for the physical altercation, but just camaraderie and just like the whole team, you say coming together and, 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 and showing, showing, showing what they're about and showing their hearts, you know what I mean? And because, what it does, it, it it honestly embodies the the community and the city that's behind them. You know yeah. what I mean? Like we all stand up it, and say, "Yeah, yeah, hell yeah, yeah, hell yeah." And um, you know, I've been a part of some 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 unique some unique situations, and um, <laughs> I know, <laughs> you know, they've always um, they always get the chat. The the you know, good, bad, or indifferent. The chatter is always good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So and uh, well, I know yeah. that I know that one of my old uh, uh, Dodgers, Yasiel Puig, was involved in one, and he used to cause stuff all the time. <laughs> he used to yeah. get up. <laughs> He's a passionate Cuban guy, you know. He's a and, passionate uh, now guy. How do you man. feel? How do you feel about this? Um, you know, unfortunately for the viewer at home now, they have the box. Okay, they got that square that they call the strike zone. We're not mm-hmm. really seeing where that ball goes. We're not. It's not fair. It's almost like before that. Sometimes, if that ball, they, they will in, undoubtedly call the outside corner, but never the yeah. inside corner a strike. You know, when you're mm-hmm. throwing, do you have that in mind? That okay, this ump, he looks like he's kind of letting me be outside a little bit, but yeah. you know, they they have scouting reports you know, about even about the umpires to where their hot zones are, what kind of, you know, they're a high strike caller, a low strike caller. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you kind of have a sense of what the umpires or their tendencies are. But, you know, it's like I said, that's why this game is so special. I mean, humans, you know, we're habitual creatures, you know. So it's just kind of like making sure you pay, you have paid keen attention to the the game and how the game is going on you know how does your starter is he establishing strikes early on um as well as the opposition is he establishing strikes early on because if you have two erratic pitchers starting pitchers who are all over the place how can you expect the umpire to be you know fair. on point yeah, yeah. how can yeah. you expect it to be fair on both sides of the coin so um 
you you get a scouting report on the umpires, but it's really about watching the game, you know, because the game is that's one of my favorite sayings from Wild Washington that he's told me, and I don't know who he got it from. He said, uh, "Do what the game asks you to do." Yeah, yeah. Ron Washington is that. great, ma- great. And that's manager. it's as simple as that. You know, the game is going to tell you what yeah. to do if if uh, a guy who's got up in the first inning, third inning, and sixth inning has clapped and hit three bombs off a of fastball. Well, shit. If I'm coming in the ninth inning. Probably not going to get. Probably I might get. I might get him a fastball, but it's going to be a fastball that's off the plate, above yeah. above his hands. But you're probably going to see. You're probably going to see off speed because you're showing you that. Got? You can, what do you? Uh, you have for three me, main my pitches? repertoire is just uh, fastball, twelve six curveball, and changeup. Okay, what's a twelve so, six curveball? Oh, oh, that's a twelve six straight six. up and down. Yeah, twelve yeah, straight six, up and down. Down. Yeah. It looks like it's coming in like a grapefruit, and it just drops. I think you know. Yeah, to the all around the table. That's, there's that's a lot of point, guys. Man. I mean, there's there's a couple of things. Uh, they're trying to speed the game along, but I think the video replay, the the, the human error, uh, is not allowed now by the umps. So once we get into that challenge, then we're going to start talking about balls and strikes. We're going to start talking about the the uh, 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 what's it called approximation play where the Mm -hmm. double play it used to be the proximity thing where if you were close enough if you weren't touching I used to see it's almost like I used to see guys turn a double play and never even touch second base it's almost like the traveling rule yeah Mm -hmm. yeah I mean in basketball do they enforce the traveling rule no you see guys run I mean unless it's blatant blatant yeah yeah but there's a certain amount of you know a human error that makes the game turn where now if we keep going to, uh, like the issue the big issue i think for pitchers would be a robotic strike zone how can that help you you know um it could help us because if it could help us or it could hurt us i mean it's all dependent on the technology that would be used right so yeah. if you have lasers if you have lasers that are creating the box that you're supposed to pitch to then theoretically, then anytime the ball nicks or hits that line of that laser, no matter if it's, if it's just, I mean, I mean, just the hair, it just nicks it. Yeah. I mean, it, it that honestly could benefit us, you know, do you visualize would, the box? Do you visualize it when you're pitching or just the, the um, target? no, no, I personally don't. Um, I kind of have an idea. Cause so the, the plate, um, home plate, the face is about 17 inches in front yeah so i mean i have a pretty good sense i've just been playing the game long enough to where the 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 strike zone is the only thing that i do is um i kind of bring it up and down depending if i'm facing the aaron judge or uh jose altuve yeah oh it's gotta be that's the extreme yeah yeah exactly so but it's never really left and right you know it's never horizontal you know you got to pitch within that that home plate um but the up and down vertically um and is really in hor- and is really what you got to work with, you know what I mean? So I don't really focus on that. I just try to execute my execute my pitches to the best of my ability and and throw strikes, man. I mean, at the end, of, like you said, man, if a guy can get three hits out of seven, he's a, or sorry, three hits out of ten, he's a Hall of Famer. He's a genius. If I can figure, and if, use, I can fi- yeah, if I can figure ahead. out how to exploit him one hundredth more, so where he yeah. can reach two out of ten, you know, then I'm doing my job really well. Uh, how do you feel about uh, having to uh, face three batters? Uh, that's that the specialist is gone now. Um, I personally never really affected me being a high inning leverage guy. I've always had to face yeah. uh, lefties and righties in my career, yeah. but I like it because I mean it's not to knock anybody who's a specialist, right? I mean lefty specialists, you know those guys are very, very, very cool to watch. Um, but I just think it creates a better ball player, a well, a, yeah. a well better, a much better pitcher, if you ask me, because now you have you're forcing the development, the progression for each individual to have to be able to pitch to both sides of the ball, rather than yeah. only be able to focus on one side. No, you have to be a you have to bring the complete package as a pitcher because that's what you're called. A pitcher is no is almost a paint is the same as a painter. <laughs> you know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. You need yeah, to be so able to you paint, paint the both corners. sides of the canvas. <laughs> paint the yeah, corners. Yeah. yeah. So. Hey, uh, what about this um, seven-inning double play rule? I mean, so much seven can inning. happen in the eighth and ninth 
in a game. Oh, you mean like the double? I mean double. I, I mean double header. I'm sorry, double header rule. Um, that that a seven inning double header rule. I, I I personally I like it, but I think you're right. You know, it takes out the eighth and ninth inning game, but I think it just has to come down to a mental shift. I mean, because if you look at the way pitchers pitch now, pitchers aren't even throwing full nine innings now. Yeah. So, so now me, you're a I've, sixth inning guy. Yeah, yeah, you'll but, become a even, but no, but not even that for the starters. I mean, if your mentality, if you only got to go seven innings, shit, go the whole, go the whole seven. Seven. You if they can make ten? five, they're good now. <laughs> you know. Well, exactly. <laughs> five and five and eighty pitches. You know, and they they they're bringing out flamethrowers. They're bringing out the dragons from the bullpen now. You know. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, I I think in my mind the greatest pitcher I ever saw was Bob Gibson. Okay, I don't think there was anybody more for the game. Uh, you know, today he'd be he'd be suspended for throwing at people, you know. Yeah. I mean, how much of that actually exists anymore? And it's a dangerous game. You know? Um, it doesn't exist that much anymore. The MLB's definitely cracked down on guys throwing throwing at people, but yeah, um, and turn still throwing up and in is something that's very much used and still alive in the game. I it's mean, important. It's, it's important. very important. You'll never you'll never get away from guys having to throw up and in uh it's the ball gets away from you sometimes right i mean it well, just not does. even that but i mean intentional being intentional pitching yeah. up and in is, is very important because then you get to expand away from the batter you know you get to expand. you're brushing them back right it, exactly it's with the other pitches them. yeah, you, yeah. He, the dude's getting a little bit he's gonna be a little less um you know bold as to step into that box and try to you know he'll lean over the lean over the plate 